Amen. Amen. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Um, I've just been loving what God's been doing here. Um, I'm, I'm excited about what we have coming up. A lot of good things. We want to build community. We want to reach our community. Um, and we want to equip our community. Um, we're in this space right now where uh, we're really pressing into something new. We feel the momentum of what God is building up here. And it's not just for our church. It's, it's for uh, the church here in Bucks County. And, but before I, before I get into some of this, I want to uh, share uh, just a prophetic word that I was sensing from the Lord as I was putting this message together um, this week. Um, I feel like it's just an update, if you will, a sense of what's happening right now um, in this season. And what I saw is a strong spirit of deception that is increasing on the earth right now. Um, there is a strong spirit of deception that is increasing on the earth right now. One of the major markers and quality of the last days is deception. Uh, Jesus says it in Matthew 24 over and over and over again. If you really want to know what's important to Jesus, pay attention to what he repeats. If God has to repeat himself, it means that it's something that's vital for our, our knowledge and for our understanding. And uh, Jesus says at the beginning of the chapter of Matthew 24 and at the end of the chapter of Matthew 24, do not be deceived. And what I saw is this strong spirit of deception increasing in the earth, making things that are obviously clear confusing. Making things that are obviously clear confusing. You know, Satan is the author of confusion. The Bible says that he is the prince of the power of the air, that he is a lion that is roaming about seeking whom he may devour. And I saw specifically this spirit attacking strong leaders and emerging leaders in this hour. And they was bringing uh, uh, about confusion concerning purpose, direction, and function. Confusion about whether or not they were hearing God's voice. Confusion about direction and decisions. And it's not because they don't hear clearly. It's because of the attack. It's, it's an aspect of spiritual warfare uh, that's happening on the earth right now. Um, I actually saw, again, the spirit of deception increasing even in society where it talks about, in I believe in 2 Thessalonians, how people will have a conscience seared with a hot iron, not being able to differentiate their hypocrisy. Um, it, it's madness. And, and we're seeing it in the news. We're seeing it in all the propaganda. Uh, we're seeing it in the double standard for so many of these, what I call, false social justice movements. It is a spirit of deception where people cannot even see their own hypocrisy because they've refused the truth. When we refuse truth, our default is deception. When we refuse to see what's real and what's true, when we move away from the scripture, the word of God, which has founded the world, it says the, words, the worlds were framed by what? The word of God, Hebrews 11. When we move away from that framing, from that foundation, our default will be deception. Jesus said the deception in the last days would be so great that even if it were possible, the elect, those who have been awakened, those who have been enlightened, would be deceived. But I heard the strategy from the Lord to say that praise will silence the enemy, that we're in a place where we need to learn how to clear atmospheres. When you're feeling bombarded, when you're feeling confused, whether it's about purpose, direction, or decisions, we need to enter into a place of worship because it says in the Psalms that praise will silence the voice of the enemy. Praise will silence the voice of the enemy. Praise is a weapon. And I, and I believe that on the flip side of this, those who are feeling this confusion, this cloudiness that is happening on the earth as they begin to worship and, and seek the Lord, that God is actually going to raise up believers to have a voice of clarity in the midst of confusion. Some of you need to receive it, that, that there are going to be believers that the Lord is going to raise up and anoint to be a voice of clarity in the midst of confusion. I just want to say that the world is never going back to what it was. 
Um, we have to get this into our hearts and into our minds. We're going to continue to see an increase of disaster, of societal catastrophes, a spirit of violence. All of these things are going to increase. But as the church, as the body of Christ, we have to hold this tension of Isaiah 60 where it says, Deep darkness covers the earth, but behold, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. In the midst of this darkness that is increasing on the earth, the glory of God is meant to actually increase upon us in such a fashion that it's going to be so clear to the world where they need to go for the answers. The Lord is going to begin to raise up Christians as a voice of clarity in our culture to dispel the confusion. Listen, I want to say I'll even bear witness from my own life since this Israel-Hamas war broke out. Um, it has actually been a launching pad to preach the gospel. Um, tragedy, crisis is always the place where the church thrives the best. Um, we don't do good in times of comfort because we get complacent and spiritually lukewarm. But when crisis comes, that's when the church does its best work. Come on, he that has ears, let them hear. The hour is now. The Lord is going to begin to position us to speak clarity to those who are confused, who are depressed, who are hopeless, who are lost, because that is what the enemy is robbing from the earth right now. And I also want to say that in a time like this, we cannot afford to be somewhere where God has not called us. You cannot afford to invest in somewhere where God has not called you to invest. Don't just stay somewhere because it's comfortable. Move and follow the Spirit and go where the Lord is calling you to go. Amen. Hallelujah. So that's a word of warning and a word of wisdom for us as we start off this message this morning. Listen, it's a joy for me to, to share the Word of God. I want to welcome any first-time visitors. I want to speak a blessing over uh, those who are watching online. Uh, my name is George Matthew Clash, the lead pastor here at The Crossing. And uh, as you saw the trailer, again, I want to highlight, I got a couple commercials, want to highly encourage you to sign up for the Holy Spirit Conference. I'm believing that this is going to be a powerful convergence for those who attend. This isn't just going to be some conference, some good teaching. We have some amazing people who are going to be here specifically to build into your life for purpose. This is not about a spiritual high. This is about equipping the saints for the work of ministry so that we can make the impact that Jesus has given us authority to make. And we can't do that in our own strength, not by might, not by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And we want to see the spirit of might come upon the body of Christ, which is, again, one of those sevenfold spirits before the throne of God, to empower us to reach the world in our community to do something. I'm really believing for um, the Lord to, to, to mark people and to release them into everything that they have been called to do. And uh, so sign up. You won't, you'll be glad that you did. Sign up for the, uh, the uh, giveaway that we're going to be doing. It's going to be awesome. Um, and I just want to briefly mention again a follow-up from last week that we are in phase two of our Build His Church campaign. This is our vision right now for 2023 into 2024. Um, we're challenging ourselves with this question. What does it look like for 100% of the church to do 100% of the work? Because in so many ministries, you got 20% of the church doing 100% of the work. Any, any leaders in the room, can I get a amen? All right, we know what that's like. And in this vision, we have four priorities uh, we want to be kingdom-focused, we want to be family-focused, presence-driven, and service-oriented. Who wants to be great? Come on, some of y'all want to be, some of you being too shy. The Bible says greatness looks like service. Whoever wants to be great must be the servant of all, is what Jesus said. So in this season, we're really focusing in on service-oriented. Uh, we're building up existing and new areas of ministry. And in phase two, uh, we've launched four new areas of ministry that we are building out. Facility, um, interior design, evangelism, and intercession. Who, who signed up for 
a ministry already. Just raise your hand show, so, so we can get some support. Praise the Lord. If you have not done that yet, I know specifically I'm looking for some more people on that evangelism team where we're going to be going out regularly, praying for people and sharing the gospel all around Bucks County. How does that sound? Start casting down strongholds. Start messing with uh, the strongholds that Satan has set up right here in Bucks County in our society. You know, the devil becomes ineffective when people get saved. Amen. The worst person you know becomes the greatest tool in God's hands when they get saved. So we want to start actually stepping out of our comfort zone and, and allowing for the Lord to use us to make an impact all around Bucks County, Mercer County, and Philadelphia. Hallelujah. All right, so sign up. We still have some sign-ups outside in the lobby today. All right, y'all ready for the word? Come on. All right, we're there. We're getting there. We got, some, we got a good word. So this is going to be our final message in our series, uh, Rooted. And uh, we've been talking about over the past four weeks uh, this idea of what is it that God does as we gather here in the local church. We've been looking at the spiritual, practical purposes of the local church. Uh, the Bible says in uh, 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 1 Corinthians 12 that we are all members of one another. We're members in the body of Christ. And that when we're called by God, he doesn't just call us to himself. He calls us to community. Uh, it's, there's this strange idea out there that you can have a relationship with Christ but not be a part of a church, which is um, absolutely unbiblical. Uh, when we're called to Christ, we're called to be a part of his body. Now, it doesn't matter if it's a small church, if it's a mega church, if it's a house church. The point is there is a fellowship that you need to be walking in, a relationship that, need, that you need to be walking in with God's people. God places us in a local fellowship where we are developed in the calling that he has on our lives to build and advance his kingdom. And uh, for many of us, again, we've been kind of unpacking this for the last four weeks. And these things that we've been sharing, they're not just my priorities. These are the priorities that are set forth in God's word. As we've been teaching through this series, we're looking at the blueprint of what the scripture says about the local church. Now, I just want to make this clear. Jesus is the head of the church. Amen. Hallelujah. Not a man, not a woman. Jesus is the head of the church. God appoints leaders as under shepherds who will protect and position the body of Christ to receive the grace of what Jesus is doing in any particular season throughout history. Anything else other than that is a deviation from what leadership really should do. Last week, we talked about God's house being a house of glory, um, that the church is filled with glory as every person is positioned and fitted into their proper place. If you're just sitting on the sidelines, there's a glory, there's a fullness that the body of Christ, that that local church that you're a part of, is missing out on. Because we saw in, in, the, in the tabernacle of Moses, we saw in Solomon's temple, and we saw on the day of Pentecost when everything came together, fitted properly, the glory of the Lord filled the place. And that's what we want to see happen right here at the crossing. Look over here, Lord. Somebody just wave at Jesus. Say, look at me, look at me. We want to be a holy temple fitted together for the presence of God to rest. Someone say together. It's not enough that we have anointed men and women and they're doing great things. We want to see an anointed people, an anointed congregation that carries the glory of the Lord and that is making an impact where God has placed you. There's no mistake about where you are. God is strategic about putting you where you are. And that's an extremely important reality for us in the body of Christ. I shared a prophetic prediction last week that the restoration of all things in Acts 3.21 will be precipitated by what the Bible calls the restoration of the tent of David, which means that there will be not just a few pastors and shepherds who have a heart after God, but an entire church, an entire people who have a heart after the Lord and who are lovesick for Jesus, a spotless bride waiting and anticipating the return of the Lord. That is the kind of church that Jesus is coming back for. 
He's not coming back for wanderers. He's not coming back for those whose eyes are set on other things. He's coming back for a people who have dove's eyes, as it says in Song of Solomon. Um, Dove's eyes, for those who maybe hear that and don't know, when a dove falls in love, it falls in love for its entire life. It doesn't go after any other doves. When we fall in love with Jesus, he gives us dove's eyes. He gives us this heart to say, Jesus, you're all I want, you're all I need, and, that's, and you're the most important thing to me. And that is a fervor, a spiritual fervor that I believe will fill God's house, not just leaders. It will fill God's house. And I'm telling you, Jesus is that good part that will not be taken from us, church. Everything in our life can be taken from us, every single thing, but Jesus cannot be taken from us, and no one can take us from him no matter what it is, right? Things present, things to come, uh, angels, principalities, powers, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. The restoration of the tabernacle of David is going to be the restoration of a lovesick church on the earth, walking in intimacy and impact. Come on now. Hallelujah. We all here? So listen, I want to get very practical about how this all ties in together today. Uh, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. It's going to be our final message in the series. So if you will turn with me, I'll be reading from the New International Version. It says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows, and the body itself, and the body builds itself in love as each part does its work. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. This is probably one of my most favorite passages in the Bible. I find myself consistently coming back to it. Um, it's been a theme over, I want to say, the last few years of trying to understand this dynamic of what is it that church leadership is really responsible for? And when I think about my journey in the Lord over the past few years, I've had the privilege of being a part of a few different ministries long enough that I benefited in some way from what God was doing in that house. Um, I have this conviction that uh, though every church, every ministry preaches and teaches the Bible, have similar theology and traditions, each have their own unique emphasis and manifestation of God's presence in their house. Can I get a witness? Um, you see it even in the letters. Paul commended the churches for different things. Uh, he corrected them for different things. Jesus did the same thing. He, he, he commended churches for certain dimensions of spirituality and realities and then uh, corrected. Um, can I just tell you something plain and simple? There's no perfect church. But there is a right church for you. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Um, the very first church I attended was a big Baptist church in Franklin Park, New Jersey called First Baptist of Lincoln Gardens. At that time that I was uh, attending there, um, the Reverend Dr. Buster Soares was the pastor, um, and it was an amazing ministry for me early on in my faith. And when I think about what the Lord was building into my life in that season, uh, there were two themes that I can, I can see. Um, there was, number one, a serious uh, love for the word. If you've ever been to a Baptist church, uh, they will preach the word. You will learn the word. You will know the word. 
Uh, but that might be the extent of it. It's, they kind of beat you, beat you up with the word too. Um, I also was challenged to see that my faith have works. In fact, that was the tagline of the ministry, faith in action. So there was a lot of different community initiatives, outreaches, and things that this ministry did. I learned, as the author of Hebrews says or calls it, the elementary things of the faith as I honed in on my love for the word of God through that ministry. I transitioned to another church for a season that flowed more in the supernatural. They were a non-denominational church, kind of a Baptist flavor. Every non-denominational church, by the way, has the flavor of whatever it broke off from. Fun fact. Uh, So this was uh, more of a non-denominational church, but it was like, you know, a little bit like a Baptist church. They flowed in the supernatural. Um, There's an expectation for God to actually move in tangible ways in the service And there was a strong emphasis in teaching, and I want to say a sound teaching, on tithing and giving. And it was there that the Lord began to teach me how to excel in the grace of giving. And he built that into my life. And the pastor, he often talked about the storm and how to trust God in the storm. And the Lord was showing me how to actually believe in the Lord and walk faithfully with the Lord through trials, through times of difficulty, through troubles, and had some incredible things happen while I was there. That was the unique manifestation of God's spirit moving in that church. And while I was a part of that church, I participated in that grace. Now, when I think of the crossing, more often than not, those who are drawn to this house um, have a desire for the deeper things of God's spirit, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, They want to have a more dynamic, spirit-filled walk with God where um, experiencing the presence of God in their life is tangible and evident. Hallelujah. Can I get amen? Amen. Come on. That's what we want. We don't don't just walk around hoping God is with us. Um, There is a real sense of his presence that God wants us to carry. We don't have a mental ascent kind of faith. We have an experiential kind of faith. And if you're not experiencing your faith, you might be walking in a season of faith, right? Because we walk by faith, not by sight. But there are times where the Lord wants us to, um, again, know how to enter into his presence where there's fullness of joy. We should be people of his presence. We're a house that trains up leaders and sends out leaders to advance God's kingdom. And here's the deal. As we look at this passage in Ephesians 4, every church at some level should be accomplishing what Paul talks about here in this passage, which is the equipping of the saints. Look at your neighbor and say, get equipped. (laughs) Hallelujah. When we think about the church, when we think about why we come together, it's not just for you to hear a sermon about how to have a better life. Listen, if you follow God's commands, you'll have a good life. But God is so much more concerned with us than having a good life. He wants us to have a fruitful life. He wants us to have an impactful life. He wants us to have a life that makes those around us question whether or not they should really be not believing in God. They want to, we should be living a life where we're going from glory to glory in such a way where people go, maybe God is real. Uh, You should have enough longevity and enough of a witness in your life that people can come to you after they've watched you for decades. And you'll be able to give them a right word in season. God is strategic about who and where he leads us. And he is always building something into our life, no matter where we are. Under that banner of equipping the saints comes all kinds of things that we need to do to watch over one another in love. I want to say this. Equipping does not happen on accident. Maybe it has for some of us. Maybe because of different leaderships that we have sat under, they've never taken that time to figure out, how do I actually help this person get from point A to point B? How do I help them in their journey of discovering what it is that the Lord is doing in their life so that they can do everything that they're called to do? Equipping has in its sight the end of every believer being fit for ministry. You know, I've heard uh, church leaders critique churches for just doing evangelism and not discipleship. Oh, evangelism, they're doing evangelism in a vacuum. Um, I, I've, I've heard of churches uh, just doing endless discipleship. Endless classes, endless workshops, trainings. 
and not releasing people into their God-ordained roles. That's just as bad as doing evangelism without discipling people. You got all these well-equipped people and you're not even using them. You got all these well-equipped people and you're not even positioning them. You find in many churches overtrained disciples with no outlets. In this passage, God makes it clear, Paul makes it clear that the equipping of the church happens through leadership. The church cannot be edified or built up unless leadership equips and empowers them to do so. I'm giving you my job description. In many circles, it's what we call the frozen chosen who do everything. In many circles, it's the pastor who does everything. And in our ignorance, we praise the pastor who moves from his position behind the podium to the pulpit to pick up a shovel or a table and serve. Let me just make something very clear. According to this passage, Ephesians 4, 11, it says, The Lord has sent you a pastor, a prophet, an evangelist, a teacher to perfect you and mature you in your faith. That is where they will be of best use to you. If you have a call to four-time ordained ministry, it's something God has crafted you for in your mother's womb. Jeremiah didn't become a prophet. He was born a prophet. We're not born and become pastors. You were created to be a pastor. You were created. See, see, in Ephesians 4, we get something called the gifts to the church. 1 Corinthians, we have the gifts of the church. That's for all. Ephesians 4 is talking about what's for some. And these gifts come from Christ. The gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 come from the Spirit. But if we go back just a little bit, it says um, in verse, let's see here, in verse 10, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens. So Christ himself gave what? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to what? To equip the saints, not to do everything in the church, to equip you to do everything that God's called you to do so that the body can edify itself in love. My goal as your pastor is the same as it was for any and all who are called to ministry to raise up church leadership, to raise up abled, equipped people in the body to do what God has created them to do. This is, we see this, this uh, priority in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. Paul says, it's he who we proclaim, admonishing and teaching with all wisdom. So that what? We may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Another translation is, it says to, to present everyone perfect in their relationship to Jesus. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy that Christ works powerfully in me. That's what the empowerment for leadership is. Whether it's for you to move a table, start that kingdom business, whatever it is, to start the small group, to join the prophecy team, uh, to join the evangelism team, to get on the intercession team, uh, to, to do something and to be equipped in it so that you can make the impact that God wants you to make. You know, I, I remember when I first started going to church, I was just happy being saved. I didn't even need to do anything. I was happy going to church, reading my Bible, having a relationship with God. But there's responsibility that comes with that. There's something more that God wants out of our life than just a good life. He wants us to make an impact on people, especially now more than ever, as the world again is being robbed of hope. This might be a little controversial, but I want to make this statement. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers are still functioning in the church today. They might not call themselves apostles, but you'll see the work of an apostle in their life. They may not call themselves prophets, but you will see the work of a prophet in their lives. These things never ceased because the Bible makes it clear when these things will cease. It says, when everyone's perfect, who's perfect? We're not done yet. There is still work to do. We might venture and say, this person's an evangelist, but when we start talking about apostles and prophets, we get nervous because those ministries have a different priority than our creature comforts. Apostles and prophets come to shake things up, to break down what is not of God and to build up what is. They have a priority of bringing heaven to earth. 
They have a priority of seeing you become, again, what God has called you to do. A pastor will walk with you through every issue that you have because they're there to care for your soul. In the days ahead, it will be common knowledge for the majority of the church to recognize these offices in a church. Because each one of those ministries brings something that the other does not. It's not a hierarchy. So many people think, well, I'm an apostle now. Apostles are the lowest of all because of what they have to do. And what they have to do, they can only do for a certain amount of time. Paul didn't stay in Ephesus. He put someone there. I'm not going to get too deep into this. The argument against apostles and prophets that they have ceased is a cessationist heresy. And there's nothing in the Bible to indicate that this is true. The same goes for the ceasing of the gifts. What I love is that these apostolic gifts, they go, well, you can only be apostle if you saw Jesus in the flesh. And I will say there is a distinction between the 12 apostles and the apostles that Jesus is talking about, or that Paul is talking about right here in Ephesians 4.11. These apostles come after the ascension. The 12 were chosen before the ascension. So there is something special about the 12, but I, I, I want to make it very clear. These offices still very much exist and are needed in this day. Quick teaching briefly on these apostles. There's a distinction between the 12 and these ones that are talked about here. Uh, apostolic leaders tend to have a specific ministry and message to establish in the body of Christ. Uh, every apostolic leader has a dominating revelation that they establish in the body of Christ. If you need a historical example, uh, look at John Wesley, look at Martin Luther, look at Augustine. Um, there's always been apostolic leaders who have shaped Christian thought throughout history. They just weren't always acknowledged as apostles while they were alive. Prophets and apostles work hand in hand. You want to know the first combination? John and Jesus. It says that the church has been established on the foundation of apostles and prophets. We know Jesus, again, is the chief cornerstone. John was a prophet. Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the apostle of our salvation. He is the bishop of our souls. There's always this combination, and we could talk about it in modern times. There's often a grace given to prophets to reveal the will of God to the church in a given season. They make known the grace and often the strategy of heaven, but a prophet does not exist for themselves. They exist to equip the church to hear God's voice. So if you're sitting under a prophetic movement, don't be surprised if you start to have more prophetic encounters and, and dreams and visions, which is normal Christianity. Someone just say it's normal. It's normal. If you're sitting under a ministry that has more of an evangelistic leader, don't be surprised if you're seeing more opportunities and doors open for you to witness and minister and reach people. The evangelists, God bless them, don't want to be in the church, but they were made for the church. It says that these ministries exist to equip the church. Imagine what would have happened if I mean, Billy Graham, he reached thousands, he reached millions, he preached in almost every nation in the world. But imagine what would have happened if he would have planted himself somewhere and multiplied himself. Same with prophets. Pastors, they have a ministry to shepherd, to guide, to counsel, to nourish the body. So don't be upset if you have an apostolic leader who doesn't want to talk about all your problems. Because an apostolic leader wants to give you breakthrough. An apostolic leader wants to lead you to a place of breakthrough. A pastor will walk with you through those things. The office of a teacher is meant to equip the saints to be fruitful in their knowledge of God. You know, I used to laugh. I was at Cairn University, and I had so many of these professors. They would say, yeah, I pastored for X amount of years, and then I just realized... It wasn't for me. And now they're thriving in seminary. You know why? They were not pastors. You're a teacher. A teacher has a hard time pastoring because they want to teach. And God bless them. Let them teach. That's what they do well. But we have a lot of teachers who are pastors, and their church is hurting because they're not pastoring them. Mm. Lord Jesus, have mercy. As we think about the church as a house of equipping, we need to set our minds on these different, again, leadership roles. This is God's ecclesiology. This is God's leadership 
structure. And again, I want to prophesy that it will become normal in the years ahead to see these things put in place in different churches, whether it is externally advertised or internally advertised. And us here at the crossing, we want to be an apostolic house where you recognize these offices. And I believe that there are people in this church that God is beginning to raise up in those offices. Come on, y'all should be shouting, y'all should be praising. Hallelujah. Because that's where the fullness of God comes. When you look at churches that are making some of the greatest impact in the world right now, they're operating in this. Come on. Apostles will help you to build. You get a builder's anointing under their anointing. Prophets will help you to hear God's voice. Evangelists will give you grace to reach the lost. Pastors will help nurture and, and care for your faith. And teachers will enlighten, unfold, and expound the word of God to you in a way that opens it up like you didn't see before. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, but we're not going to do that today. So according to this passage, there's six priorities that we see for the equipping of the saints. Uh, verse 13, to bring the church into unity. That hasn't happened yet, but it will. To bring revelation concerning the knowledge of Jesus, okay? Uh, his work, his agenda, his person. Causing the church to come into maturity and fullness. Maturity has to do with spiritual formation. Fullness has to do with empowerment. The spirit, not just within you, but upon you. Um, to establish sound doctrine, verse 14. To establish the church in the communication of the things of God. Verse 15, it says that we will edify, we'll speak the truth in love and edify one another. And verse 16, which I want to really just kind of drive home with today. Effectively placing disciples in their God-given roles so the church can edify itself in love. I'm sorry if you've had pastors, if you've had leaders who have not helped you to identify your gifts and your call. Because that is the purpose of church leadership. If they're not doing that, they just want to be hurt. We need to help the church identify their gifts because we can do a lot more together than we can on our own. It says from him in verse 16, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As each one of us do our work, as each one of us contribute, as each one of us invest, the body is built up. How does God build his church? Through us, through people. We are his church. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In a true church, there will be room for you to grow and to serve. There will be room for your gifts and for you to mature in your gifts and in your faith, to be effective for what God has called you to do. And just to give you, you know, I like sticky statements here, just to give you three things to consider. I call it 3D equipping. 3D equipping. Three-dimensional. God wires each one of us with a destiny in mind that is rooted in our relationship with Jesus. So when you come to know Jesus, listen, those gifts are in you, but when you're born again, they're activated. Sometimes, depending on where you are, they're imparted to you, those gifts. Paul said to Timothy, don't forget the gifts that you received by laying on of my hands. So yes, impartation is real. So the three D's of equipping is this. You want to discover, you want to develop, and you want to deploy. Discover, Develop, deploy. When you are rooted in a church, when you're planted, when you commit yourself to a local church, your gifts and your calling will begin to emerge with clarity. If that's not happening where you are, maybe you need to transition. Your gifts, once they are discovered, begin to be developed through service and through discipleship. And after a season of development, you know what comes next. Some of y'all should get ready. Somebody just say, get ready. <laughs> Listen, I'm excited. We love that you're here. We want to see you build here. But some of you won't stay here because God's got, he's calling you elsewhere. He's calling you to go out. He's calling you to carry what God is doing here somewhere else. And to bring it. I used to go to these different ministries like, you know, you go to Bethel, like who loves Bethel, loves IHOP, loves all these spiritual hot spots. I go visit them and go to the Toronto Blessing, all that kind of stuff. It's great. But I said, God, if you could do it there, you could do it here. Amen. 
And I'd say, I don't need to move to Toronto. I don't need to move to Reading. I can go somewhere and cultivate that with you myself because you're the same God. It may not look like that, but it's still you. That's what it means to build his church. We want to be discovering our gifts. We want to be developed in our gifts. We want to be deployed to actively use our gifts. Unfortunately, in many churches, people are demeaned, demanded, and discouraged. That's the negative 3D. (laughs) They're demeaned. Oh, brother, that's not for you. Sit down over there. Oh, yeah, maybe next time. Maybe next time. They keep getting put off. You're putting the fire out. Use them. Raise them up. I don't know who this is for. They're demanded, do this, do that, do this, do that. Things that are nothing in accordance to what they're called to do. And then as a result, they're discouraged. There's no movement in their life. God have mercy on your church. God have mercy on your leaders. They're asked to serve in capacities that are not suited for their gifts and become discouraged because they can't see how God's called them. They're having a hard time seeing the two. If your gifts and your calling are not being discovered and developed, you're in the wrong church. Now, there is an initiative that you need to take. You got to spend time with Jesus. You need to spend time in the Word. We have a group that uh, we're beginning to meet with. We had our first meeting yesterday. Those who I believe who are in our church who are called to Word ministry. And um, I'm taking some time, more time, a little bit of time, to invest as much as I can in those who have that call. And there was something I shared with them yesterday. I said, you need to discern and then confirm. Discern, all right? Some of us, maybe you think you're called to something and you're not. The way you'll find out is in community. If we're speaking the truth in love to one another, we can say, I don't know if that's really for you, but this might be. You want to discern. You want to have a right estimation of yourself, as it says in First Corinthians, uh, first, uh, I'm sorry, Uh, Romans 12, have a right estimation of yourself. So spend time in church, spend time in prayer, spend time in the fellowship. Ask the Lord, how is he calling you? How are you calling me, God, to build your church and reach the lost? Ask, Ask him. He loves good questions. He loves questions that have to do with identity and purpose. God, what am I here to do? And as you discern this leadership and the fellowship around you, will confirm it. Paul didn't become an apostle, again, in a vacuum. He did so in community. It was already a call on his life. He said it didn't come from man, but people began to recognize this was what God was doing. And he was released, him and Barnabas, and then him and Silas, and then him and Timothy. You'll see that process all throughout the New Testament. So we're going to land the plane now. I just want you to consider this, okay? Okay. We want to be a house of equipping here at the crossing. Um, There's room for you. If there's something not happening yet, maybe we need to create it. And maybe you're the one that needs to start it. There's room for what God wants to do here and for what God wants to do through your life. And, uh, you know, this has to do with destiny. Jesus is our destiny, y'all. We're not just talking about a good life. We're not just talking about, like, you know, accomplishments, American dream. Throw that garbage out. Jesus is our destiny. He will give you good things along the way, but it's all to point to his goodness. He's our destiny. At the end of our life, we offer it all back to him and receive a reward. At the end of our life, he is the reward. I am the Lord. He said, what he said, Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward, Abraham. It's me, not the land, not the, not that blessing. It's me. So I want to encourage anyone who's here today. Maybe you don't know the Lord. Maybe your life's a mess. Maybe things, maybe you're walking in this confusion. Jesus dispels confusion. He is, so Satan is the author of confusion. Jesus is the prince of peace. He'll give you peace for your life, for your situation. He'll open up your eyes. It says that anyone who follows after me, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That is the promise of Jesus. I don't know if you're here today and you do not know the Lord, I want to extend an invitation for you to receive Jesus Christ, 
to receive him as Savior. He isn't just a good moral man. He is God. God in the flesh. He came to change your life. You could be a Christian your life can be messy. Get saved again. Come on. I used to say the sinner's prayer every week. I'd just pray it. Lord, save me again. Because I want to feel that again. I want that first love touch again, Lord. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord. Maybe things are not quite the way they should be. The moment you invite him in, he changes everything. The moment we ask the Lord in, he intervenes. He rescues us. We've been rescued from our sins, from the wrath to come, from hellfire. All right? We weren't prepared for hell. We weren't made for hell. Hell was prepared for the devils and his angels. But if we choose to be like Satan, we'll end up where he is or where he's going. And anytime we deny Jesus, we choose that. We choose hell. There's no other, there's no in between. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No person comes to the Father except through me. It doesn't matter. Even if you get, get it right in life and you miss Jesus, it's all for nothing. It's for nothing. What good is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? What good is it? It's about your soul. It's about forever. It's about eternity and making Jesus our greatest portion in this life because he will be our portion forever. If you'd like to receive Jesus today and you don't know him, I want you to just raise your hand. I want you to publicly acknowledge, I need a savior. I need God. I don't want to leave here without knowing where I'm going to go when I die because not another moment is promised to us, not one. But to live is for Christ and to die is gain. That's the advantage you have when you serve Jesus. That's the advantage. If you're in this room today and you do not know the Lord, you're not sure where you're going to go when you die. You don't have assurance of your salvation. I want you to raise your hand, publicly acknowledge, I need the Lord. I want to pray with you. Thank you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Listen, maybe you know the Lord, but you're in this space right now where you're saying, I don't know if I'm equipped and you want to discover your gifts or you want to develop your gifts or you feel like God wants to release you into something, we want to pray for you too. So let, let's just stand to our feet. We're going to, we're going to close out the worship, uh, to, our time together in worship. But if you'd like prayer about any one of those three Ds, any one of those things, or if you just want prayer for healing, whatever you need prayer for, um, I want to invite you to come forward. You don't have to wait until I'm done talking. You can come up now. Prayer team will meet you and pray with you. Don't worry, the food's not going anywhere. Some of you are trying to make an escape. You can get ministry. We'll make sure there's something left for you. If you want prayer, if you want prayer, choose the spiritual manna, all right? For the Lord to begin to reveal to you your gifts, how you need to develop them in this season and where he's releasing you. If you want prayer, I'm just going to invite you to come forward. Prayer team, you can come forward to receive those who are in need of prayer, who want to touch from God. Today could be your day. Amen. Sometimes he doesn't want to touch you in your seat. He wants you to come forward and say, yeah, I actually want this. Um, I'm not ashamed, Lord. Sometimes you got to come forward. Publicly confess him, not just for salvation. Hallelujah. Listen, we're going to worship church and then we will close out with the benediction. Let's worship Jesus.